This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Genesis. But before we get started, let's make sure that we've confessed our sins, that we have yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit, that we might get the most out of our study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the privilege to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back and pick up our translation at chapter 2, verse 15. Now, last time you may recall that we were looking at the garden park, often called Eden, and God puts the man in the garden a place of blessing, abundance, and fellowship with the Lord, that he would face a daily test of obedience. Verse 15 reads, And the Lord God took the man and set him in a resting place in the Garden of Eden to worship and to serve. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat from it. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helper corresponding to him. And the Lord God formed from the ground every living beast and every bird of the sky and brought to the man to see what he would name it. And whatever the man called it, the living creature, it was its name. So we see here that man is the superior living creature. He's the ruler over these other living creatures. And the Lord had him name them. Now in naming them, Adam is going to exercise his authority over the domain of the creature world. Verse 20. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every living beast of the field, but for Adam was not found a helper corresponding to him. So the man gave names to the domestic animals, the birds, and then it reads in every living beast that would be the rest of the creatures. But notice there's not even fish there to name. We wouldn't expect them there in that part of the world, especially uh, sea creatures. We might find some some ponds, but that's not the point here. He doesn't name the sea creatures. Now, the man is said to give names to the behemoth. That's the domestic animals. Many translate that word cattle. The birds of the sky. And the living things, but we translated it beast to distinguish them from the domestic animals. And the point is made that Adam, there is not a corresponding helper to him. Now, the word Adam here, some will begin to translate this with the name Adam. Well, it's basically still the same Hebrew word, except it doesn't have the article. So they will translate it Adam. But then again, you go right back to the man again in the following verses. I just thought I'd point that out because that's why you have a difference in translation sometimes. They just interpret it differently. Now remember the phrase, a helper corresponding to him. We saw that in verse 18. Ezra K. Neged O. That's kind of spreading it out for you. A helper, the word K means corresponding to, as, or like. Okay, Neged. To him. A helper corresponding to him. Man must have spent a good part of the day naming the animals, as they apparently created by him in some fashion. There's no mention of how many names or species or subspecies, but 
what we have listed in our list of three different categories or general terms. And there's no reason to think he went well beyond that, but there are some issues here we'll discuss in a moment. Because it says this all took place on the sixth day. How could Adam possibly name all the animals in one day? But there are other questions too. What about the animals that are not adaptable to that part of the world? Like the Arctic animals, we ex would we have expected him to name the polar bear? Those on the islands far away, like the kangaroo, or the koala bear, the Tasmanian devil, the panda bear. Numerous animals found only in certain regions of the world. Then there are the many birds of the worlds, the ones that we're often familiar with, the storks and the pelicans, the eagles, the condors, the parakeets. Did they do a flyby? And then we might expect to see elephants and lions and grizzly bears, but really, were all these in the garden? And why not the sea creatures? Where does the pelican or the penguin come in, rather? Now some argue that the term day actually means a long period of time, perhaps stretching out into thousands of years. Some also apply this kind of principle to mankind, that he was sort of a evolutionary creature, modified evolutionary creature that came along later. Now I'm not a scientist, nor do I pretend to be. But I do know enough to know that if we spend all our time trying to figure out trying to match science with the Bible, it's an endless task. There are all sorts of issues of space and time and matter. And some of the problems I just mentioned, then you almost start over again after the flood. You're going to have every animal in the world coming out of the ark and spreading across the planet all the way from the all the way to the North Pole, to every island around the world, and how did that happen in such a short period of time? Now some people raise these questions to actually question the validity of Scripture. And I know there's a, several ministries where Christians who truly seek answers to reconcile Scripture with science and they spend a good part of their time and life doing so. Now I'm not questioning their ministry nor their motives. I will just say this, there is so much we do not know in many scientific fields. The Hebrew says he names all the cattle, the domestic animals. He names all the birds and does this on the day that the woman is also created and then comes along. Now let me raise an issue, perhaps an answer that many have never heard before, but this seems to be a real possible answer and it's not even scientific. It seems that the animals that he named were just those in the garden. Let me give you three or four reasons. Remember back in verse 19, it looks as though an animals were created after the man was put there. Would this be particularly animals made in the garden, adaptable to that climate, that time? This would mean that the world had already been populated with animals, but then the garden was a special situation. And we already know that to be the case. It was perfect. It was a controlled environment with the Lord himself at the thermostat. A second reason it may be just animals in the garden, as we have just seen, after man names the animals, the point is made that he does not have a suitable helper. This would imply that one of the purposes of him naming the animals is for him to realize he needs to get ready for his own mate. Add to this, as we're going to see in verse 23 coming up, when man says, this one at last, 
That's after seeing all these animals. So the idea behind it is that he names the animals in order to prepare him to identify the one for him. This solution, number three, would also eliminate the problem of the man naming the animals worldwide, including sea creatures, and the great number he would have to name in such a short time. Whether that is the best solution, I don't know. Sometimes scripture just doesn't give us enough information. We have to accept it for what it says. So we read this for what it says. He named the animals. Otherwise you end up a, well, you end up with an endless line of unanswered questions that perhaps should not even be asked in the first place. But the conclusion we should draw at the end of this parade of animals is that none of the animals were even a close match for him there was not found a helper corresponding to him. And that prepares us for the next event, the creation of the woman. What the first man needed was a helper that could actually help him with what he needed. Man could not accomplish what God wanted him to do by himself. He needed a suitable helper. So in verse 21, God provides a solution. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he was asleep, he took one part from his sides and closed up the flesh under it. I suppose you haven't seen quite this translation before. We often see the word rib. But let me show you where I and others have got this translation. Let's look at some of the words. We see the phrase, cause to fall. The Lord caused to fall a deep sleep. The word for fall is a word we've seen many times. We'll see it more times, especially in Genesis. Now fall, it means to fall. Here it's in the Hiphel stem. That means it's causative. So there's a cause or something caused or someone caused the fall. In this case, the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Tardama, we translate it deep sleep. And then it says, it fell upon the man, and while he was asleep, Yashin, he was asleep, the Lord took Lakak, another common word in the Hebrew, Kal, Vav, consecutive, he took, and then we have the word one. That's all it is, it's just the word one. It's the word ekad, the numeral one. It doesn't say rib. We can fill in what it is if we think we know what it is. The problem is we're not told exactly what it is. But we have some good evidence that what it may be. <clears throat> Because it tells us from where this one, whatever it is, came from. It came from his side, actually in the plural, his sides. Selah. This word is used for sides regarding the ark. That is the ark of the covenant, Exodus 25, 12, and 14. The 
chambers on the side of Solomon's temple were called side chambers. Another the word is used, 1 Kings 6, 5. Could also be used for a hillside. And listen to this one. Or for planks or boards of the temple wall. So I translate this one part from his sides. Now taking a rib seems all clean and neat, but it doesn't really say that. But as so many traditions that hold true in translation, that's what people have been taught, that's what they thought. It may not cause any harm to think it's a rib. It certainly has been remembered over the generations. But it appears to me that the Lord took one part from his side. And then the next few words closed up the flesh under it. That's a pretty accurate translation. The word for close up, sagar, it means to shut or close. And then the flesh under it. So he took from part of the sides and closed it up. It appears to be a pretty quick and clean operation by the Lord. His word lets us know that just as the man came from the ground, so the woman came from the man. Now think about that pattern. The woman didn't come from the ground. She came from the man. Now, None of the other female animals were said to be created this way, but only the human female. She comes from the man for a purpose or a reason. Verse 22. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the side part which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The word for fashioned, the word actually means fashioned or in other contexts context it can mean build or construct. Like one might build a house or a city. The Lord God built the woman. We use the word fashion. It indicates a little more finesse there. We're not given any details. It just says the Lord God took this side part from man and fashioned a woman. And then we have a new word introduced. One we need to get used to quickly. That's the word for woman. You probably won't forget it if you've never heard it. Isha. Isha. It means woman in this context. Wife. And can mean female. And then the Lord brought the woman to the man. The word for brought, common word, mean can mean come or go. Bow is the word. So, verse 22 reads, The Lord God fashioned into a woman the side part which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Well, the man reacts. Verse 23. And the man said, This one at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. This one shall be called woman, because this one was taken from the man. Now, if you know a lot about the Hebrew language, you know a significant portion of it is in poetry. This is poetry. You don't see it in the English. You might see it a little bit, and it's fact that it depends how you say it, I suppose, but 
Hebrew poetry wasn't like we have English poetry, where English poetry are looking for rhyme, usually. But Hebrew poetry has more to do with the number of syllables in the words, and they do counts, so it's kind of like da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-dee, da-da-da-da-dee. You know, it's something to that effect. It's almost musical. So you'll see the syllables, or you'll count the syllables. You'll see wordplay, as we have here with the man and the woman. The words man and the words for woman. There's parallelism. We see bone of my bone, bone from my bones, flesh from my flesh. And there's some other features here we won't get into right now, but this is a poem. The first poem in the Bible is the first man writing about his woman. Well, let's look at this verse even closer. The verse says, And the man said, This one at last. Now, let's look at the phrase, This one at last. It is part of our interpretation. Remember earlier I said verse 23 helps explain what was really going on when the man was naming the animals? Because this is what he's coming to after naming the animals. This one at last. Now the word this one, actually I say the word this, this one is used three times in just this verse. And with, this, with the word for this, it means this one at, at this time, now at last, after some previous activity, he comes to this conclusion. So that's why we get the phrase, this one at last. Pharaoh says that after so many, um, so many of the plagues in Exodus 9, 27, he says, this time I have sinned. Of course, we know what he does. He goes around in circles again and comes back and refuses to let the people go. The word last, at last, is a word, pa'am. It does mean finally, or now. So what we end up doing is combining this word, pa'am, with the word zot, and we get this one at last. I could use another word and use the tone, finally. Okay? After naming the animals, after going without some creature that was similar to him, he acknowledges, he recognizes that this one at last is bone from my bones. And we could say literally. Perhaps he saw the similar bone structure that he was aware of himself on his own body. This creature was upright like so many of the other creatures were on all fours. He may have seen the same skeletal structure, but this one's like him. And then add to that flesh from my flesh. He's basically saying, this one's from me. It's what I'm made of. Perhaps he saw the same fleshly features. She wasn't like the other animals. She was more like him. Skin and hair like him. Feet and hands similar to him. So he's sort of like saying, this creature's made of the same stuff that I'm made of. Do you think he realized there were some real possibilities here? Well, in fact, 
he had found him a mate. Now, at this point, the word for man changes from Adam, and I'll just put it in the English for you, to Ish. Ish. The one he called that just came into his presence, he calls Isha. There's your wordplay. Ish for man. Isha for woman. Because this one was taken from the man. So the man sees this close resemblance to himself and calls this one Isha. Now though these words are similar, they're really not related. They just sound alike because you have these same vowel sounds. This is called wordplay. Isha and Ish. And by the way, uh, when they pair up the animals for the ark over in chapter 7, it's an Ish and Isha. Male and female. Now, Adam is not naming her at this point. He's basically saying that and it's, it's hard to explain this exactly because it could it probably overlaps to other meanings, but the idea of uh, the male is that he is a male as opposed to a female. This is a female opposed to, as opposed to a male. Though we still translate it man, the idea is that, or it includes the idea that this is a male as opposed to the female. Now later, she will be named, but that's after the fall. But even calling, even calling her a woman, he begins to exercise his authority over, him, over her, which becomes an issue in the next chapter. So, our verse again. Let's get a clean sheet here. And the man said, This one at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. This one, there it is again, shall be called woman. Ish, because this one was taken from the Ish. I should have said Isha. This one shall be called Isha, because this one was taken from the Ish. Now, in verse 24, the writer of Genesis, who I accept as Moses at this part of Genesis, makes a comment. This isn't what Adam said. Verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and unites with his wife and they become one flesh. Now, why does he say this is why? Now, this is a phrase that introduces a comment. The author is going to say something that tells us why something is the way it is. Something else is the way it is, like verse 23. Oh, this explains it. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and, and, and unites with his wife and become one flesh. Isha is taken from Ish. Man brings the Isha, excuse me, the Lord brings the Isha to the Ish, and they become one flesh. But first, we look at this verse. It says, This is why a man leaves his father and mother. Let's look at that step first. That's the first thing that's Explain, explain. This is why a mother leaves his father and mother. The word is the cow perfect of Azab. Now this has a rather broad meaning having to do with physical leaving to mental or even spiritual leaving someone, spiritually leaving someone. 
like Israel, forsaking the covenant, same word. Jeremiah 1, 16, 2, 13, 17, and 19, frequent word. He leaves his father and his mother. Now some translations put in the word shall. The problem with that is it sounds like more of a command. Because that's the way we usually quote the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not uh, commit adultery. You shall not steal. Now the New Testament quote of this does translate it in the future. But in the Hebrew here, we could translate it in the presence. It's explaining a principle. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother. So you can translate it in the present tense, or you can throw in the milder future tense, will. But when we interpret something like this, and even translate it at that point, we lean towards what it would probably be in light of the culture. Within the range of the boundary, the meaning of the word, but at the same time within the culture. So we need to talk about the Israelite family for a moment. In the Israelite family, it was normally the wife who would leave her family with her husband. And then they would go live with or near the husband's family. We see this in a number of the biblical accounts. The wife goes with her husband, who is also still under the authority of his father, the patriarch, and they live with the father's family. So the word for leaving has the idea of the man shifting his loyalties from primarily from his parents to his wife because the reason we say this is because this isn't geographically leaving, nor is it emotionally leaving. It's not emotional detachment. However, there is a shift. As the man moves his loyalties from his parents over to his wife. That's the idea of leave here. Now one thing I think is often forgotten in this context as well as much in life and even among Christians is we think that once we get married and go off on our own that we don't have to honor our parents anymore. The Bible never teaches that. So what happens is, is that people have misconstrued the word leave sometime and means, well, the man has to leave the, leave the family. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that his loyalties change. His priorities are going to change. His interests change. Actually, caring for the interests of his parents and now caring to the, for the interest of his wife. His thoughts turn from his parents to his wife, from his mother to his wife. That's not a geographical change nor an emotional uh, abandonment. Now naturally he would begin to emotionally attach to his wife and she moves into the main place of his emotions and who he cares for. But he never abandons his family. Now, verse 23 also tells us that's just the first step. He leaves his father and his mother and then he unites with the wife. 
In fact, they become one flesh. So much of these passages have been misunderstood. Many a family has, or many a man has abandoned his family geographically and even emotionally without giving it much thought. Yes, we'll get over it, but you know what often happens once you move out geographically and you quit calling or you don't find a call or stay in touch? Emotional detachment begins to occur. And there's less and less contact. That often happens with friends when you move away from friends. Because you, now you don't even have the family attachment, you see. I know that some people argue, well, he had to go get a job. He has to make a living, you know, and take care of his family. But there's often a cost to that. If you have good, solid Christian parents, why would you want to move away from them? What greater asset to have? So to stay near is a way of honoring them, and then as they get older, you're available to care for them. But then they come in and say, well, then there's the intruding mother-in-law and this and that. Shouldn't be that way with Christians. There's a recognition of privacy and respect based upon love. The Bible never tells us to quit honoring our parents after we get married. In fact, as you mature, you learn to honor your parents even more. You realize what they put up with. Parents were highly honored in Israel, next to God. That's right out of the law. Let's talk about the word unites. The cow perfect tells us it has the completed action. The word is dabak. D-A-B-A-Q. It means to hold to, to stick to, to unite, to join, to grip. Let me get it up here. To put it right there. Dabak. Like a soldier might grip his sword. Now we're familiar with the old word cling. Sometimes, like I said earlier, you can't hardly get away from these old translations, but when you think of cling today, what do you think of? Uh, sounds like you're just hanging on. You're hanging on, you're clinging on the cliff. You're clinging off your fingernails, you see. The idea here is more like we use the term today, unite. And that includes what we've talked about earlier. His loyalty shift from the parents to the wife. Affections change to the wife. The wife is the one he wants to be with. The wife is the one he wants to express his affections to. His parents aren't left out. They just take a different place. Now, a couple other issues about the two words we've just seen. Remember the word leave? We said it also can mean forsake, and we saw that in the use of Israel not to forsake the covenant or abandoning the covenant. Dabak is also a covenant term for basically the opposite action. Israel was to hold fast or stay loyal to the covenant. Deuteronomy 10.20 and 11.22. So basically he leaves parents and unites with wife. So there's a shift of loyalty or loyalties. 
And then it has the word for wife, Isha, with his wife. These are both covenant terms. And this tells us something about marriage, some additional things. Since we use both terms for covenant, leaving and uniting, we can see two things about marriage. First is the man's loyalty. His loyalty to his wife. And then it's very similar to, if not a covenant, between a man and his woman, a husband and his wife. And what's this amount to? One of the key terms that's often left out in the idea of love. Commitment. He is committed to this woman. If you cannot find a woman you can commit your life to, don't marry her. The verse goes even further when it says they become one flesh. The word is basar. Looks like this. Basar. A couple of vowel points. Spelled B-A-S-A-R. We have a point here making it sharp. It's like ba. That means flesh. The idea is that two become one. So much so, it's like something else comes into existence. They become a new family unit. Call it marriage. Now, there's some things here that are so obvious. Who set this all up? The Lord God. He set it up between one man and one woman. Nothing else works. Everything else is outside God's design. This gives us God's standard and definition of marriage. And it's just not for believers, but for the human race. Male and female. When Jesus was asked by the Pharisees if it was permissible for a man to divorce his wife for any reason, there was some debate on that between the Pharisees and other so-called biblical scholars. They may have agreed that there can be divorce, but for what reason? When they ask Jesus about it, he goes back to our very verse. Matthew 19.5, he quotes our Old Testament verse that we're looking at. And said, this is Jesus, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let man not separate. That's often part of the pronouncement over a wedding. How many times we hear that and don't really consider what it means? They're no longer two, they're one. 
I've heard the analogy, it's like someone taking two pieces of notebook paper and gluing them together. Do that, then try to tear them completely apart and have two holes. You can't do it. And the conclusion that Jesus makes is what God has joined together, united. Let man not separate. Who did the joining? God. No man is to separate what God has joined together. Of course, the Pharisees come back with another question. And why did Moses permit divorce if that's the case? Okay, that's basically what they were asking. Listen to Jesus' answer. Matthew 19, 8. He said to them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hard hearts. But from the beginning, it was not this way. Two big points here. Divorce was permitted because of hard hearts. And if you've studied the heart and some of the earlier studies in this and these series, you know that's someone who has a heavy load of sin and cannot get truth through. So what's happened is they've loaded themselves up, loaded themselves up with so much sin, they can't see the truth anymore. So what is the leader to do with a bunch of people like that? He tries to control the damage. So he sets down some regulations to control the divorce rate. But Jesus makes it clear from the beginning, it was not this way. And if I might add, that's not the way it was set up. But now you've got it so fouled up, we have to give you another set of rules for people who are so fouled up. Verse 9, Jesus is again speaking. Now I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. That's pretty straightforward. Now remember something about Moses' generation? Let me go back to what we just read earlier in Matthew. They were hard of heart. The whole Moses' generation, except for a handful of people, were very rebellious against the law, did not live by faith. Remember, they didn't get into the promised land. Many of them must have fallen short of God's standard for marriage. Apparently, they had picked up a lot of the bad standards of Egypt and carried them with them. Just remember the golden calf incident. And they were divorcing regardless of design, God's design. <clears throat> so this divorce permission that Moses gives is actually additional regulations to control who can remarry after you've divorced. Some of that's in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. A man is not to remarry a woman that he's already married if she has went off and married another man in between, you see. Jesus states one clear exception where divorce is permitted, and that's when there is sexual immorality. Now, Paul also quoted our verse in Genesis. It's a beautiful passage. It's long and in-depth. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it except to mention a few things. It's in Ephesians 5, 29 and following. And we also hear this pronounced in wedding ceremonies regarding the analogy between Christ and his church 
for the man loving the woman. As Christ loved the church, so the man is to give himself up for his wife. And for that kind of loyalty and devotion, now let me say this again. I want you to kind of think this through with me. For the kind of loyalty and devotion a man needs for his wife, what does he have to do regarding his parents? I think you see what I mean. They take a different place in his life as he is joined to his wife. The unity in one flesh concept is explained in Ephesians by saying that the man loves his wife so much that it is as if he's taking care of himself. And by that we mean he washes himself, he cleans himself, he protects himself, he feeds himself. Most normal people may not admit this, but they do care for themselves. Now let me state the obvious here about marriage. There's one man for one woman, united together in matrimony. That is the design that is for the human race and that is how humans can receive blessing from their Creator. Obviously, there's no polygamy. That was forbidden. Uh, that was even stated in the law, Leviticus 18, 18, Deuteronomy 17, 17, forbid it for kings. No homosexuality. Leviticus 18, 22, Romans 1, 26-27. Anything outside of one man and one woman is a defilement and abomination. If you go back and you study those passages, you can look at, well, you might want to read the whole chapter of Leviticus 18. Much of it is about this subject as well as Leviticus 20. But when there is sexual promiscuity or adultery, the person is involved is often called defiled. If there was homosexuality or something outside of a woman, you get into the area of what is called an abomination. I would suggest you read those to get the precise meaning. I'm being a little rough here on the definitions, but the, the person is defiled and the acts are called an abomination. Back to Genesis. The last verse of chapter 2, verse 25, makes a key point about the man and woman's condition. And the man and the woman were both naked and not ashamed. The word for naked, Aram means naked or stripped of clothing. The word for ashamed, we're not ashamed. The hit polel imperfect, which means it's not only reflexive, but also intensive. There was no shame at all among themselves. There was no shame at all. I translate it not ashamed, but the idea is there was nothing in between them, and no pun intended, but they had no problem with themselves being totally naked. Now the reason this is an issue at this point is because later on in the fall, there is shame. So there's more going on here than just not wearing clothes. Being naked and not ashamed tells us that they are in a state of innocence. 
they had no qualms about walking around naked. And I can just picture in my mind some of my little children in the past. They thought nothing of walking around the house naked. And what I didn't always quite understand is why they always do that with their hands in the air. <laughs> well, that brings back some strange memories, I might say. There's not been any abuse or exploitation of sin between this couple, perfectly comfortable with themselves and in the presence of God. Now, the Lord later will provide clothes. At this point, they're not needed. This all begins to change after they disobey and befall, where nakedness becomes associated with being shameful. We'll discuss that when we get there. But let me close with just a couple more comments about marriage, because we did get into that subject a little bit. Marriage is one of the several institutions ordained by God for the human race. Marriage constitutes one man and one woman to form one flesh, one union. The original design was for them to be together to the death of one. Only after the fall and due to the hardness of men's hearts is their divorce regulated. Hebrews 13.4 says, Hebrews 13.4, let me get that on the board for you. <clears throat> marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Notice the word defiled again. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So we are warned to not get out of line both before and after marriage. Well, that closes chapter 2. Now, chapter 3 introduces a new scene and a new character where we will look at the fall and its consequences. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have designed a beautiful institution of one man and one woman in marriage. We pray for all of those out there who are married, who struggle in areas of their marriage with themselves and together in the circumstances they face. We ask that you will give them strength to follow your commands in marriage to stand for the truth we ask these things in Jesus name Amen <clears throat>